Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is an internationally renowned director and producer whose prolific body of work connected him to some of the most highly acclaimed TV shows and miniseries of all time. He worked on iconic shows like I Love Lucy, Hogan's Heroes, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, The Bob Newhart Show, Kojak, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, and many more. He directed groundbreaking miniseries including Shogun, Wheels, The Scarlet and the Black, Ellis Island, and Chiefs, to name only a few. He's worked with legendary stars including Betty Davis, Gregory Peck, Doris Day, Rock Hudson, Richard Burton, Christopher Plummer, Sir John Gielgud, and even Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson. He's directed over 30 Oscar winners in 11 miniseries, 40 made-for-TV movies, and over 350 hours of television series. He's received three Emmy nominations and won a Directors Guild of America Award for Outstanding Directorial Achievement. And he's written a fascinating and thoroughly engaging memoir entitled From I Love Lucy to Shogun and Beyond. Tales from the Other Side of the Camera. I'm so happy and proud to welcome one of the most prolific and highly respected television directors of all time, Jerry London. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Well, that's a great intro. Thanks very much. You deserve it. I want to ask you to take your mind back to September 1955, when you were an apprentice film editor at Desilu Studios working on I Love Lucy. Did you ever imagine that you would end up becoming such an accomplished director and producer? No. Actually, I took art in school and I wanted to be an art director. But the union was so tough that you had to be a, a son or a daughter of one of the other art directors to get in. So there was no way. And my uncle, who was the manager of one of the studios, knew a lot of people. And he said, are you looking? I can't get you in the art director's thing. It's, a, it's closed, but how about film editing? And I said, well, what is it? Because I, I had no idea. I mean, I've been in studio lots before because he let me come in a, and they were shooting on Saturdays at that time. And I'd walk around and I was always fascinated by it, but I really never got into quote editing. So he took me over to meet some film editors right on the lot there. And he said, this is my, my nephew. And I'd like to let him spend some time here and see if he likes it, you know. And so every Saturday, since I was still going to school at the time, I would go over and spend the day with the editors for about six weeks. And I learned how to do the the basic things that a an apprentice would do, like splice film. And at that time, you used actually a, a celluloid glue to put it together. And you had to do what's coded, code which would sync up the soundtrack and the film. And I, I actually learned how to do it. And then about a, after that time, he called his uh, friend who was the editorial head of, at Desi Lu, And he said, I want you to meet my nephew. He's very interested in getting in the movie business, et cetera, et cetera. And that was actually uh, Desi and Lucy's editor, Daniel Kahn, who ran the Desilu editorial department, and he hired me. And uh, it was September 1st, 1955, and it was 100 degrees that day. i never forget it. And that was the beginning of the adventure. I want to ask you about I Love Lucy. You wrote that you sometimes got the chance to watch Lucy and the other cast members rehearsing on the set. What was that like? Well, that was, you know, lots of fun at the time, you know, uh, it was the hot show, number one show, and it was great watching come the rehearse and uh, listening to what, what Desi and Lucy would say. And uh, I had no idea that, you know, it turned out to be a classic piece of history, but I usually would go down there and, and, and when I heard there was kind of a guest star and like Bob Hope was there and Milton Berle, and I looked just take take a look, you know, a young kid taking a look. And it was great. And then at, at night, they would shoot, start shooting about five in the afternoon. And um, I went to a lot of the filmings because, you know, I, I had access to it. What a memory. Great, great fun. Really was. I can only imagine. 
Now, we all know how important Desi Arnaz was in developing the three camera system of filming TV shows. But what I also learned from your book, Jerry, is that Desi Arnaz was heavily involved in editing I Love Lucy. So you must have worked quite closely with him. Well, every Saturday we would take the prior week's cut film and show it to Desi. And, and, and Danny Kahn was there and the, the actual film editor was Bud Mullen, who I worked for. I was the apprentice. And then uh, after one season, I moved up to its assistant editor. And we would go to Desi's house. He had three houses, Del Mar, Palm Springs, and Beverly Hills. And depending where he was on that Saturday, we'd bring the film and run it with him. And he would make suggestions or, you know, approve it. But he was very intelligent and a very nice person. He really was. He was great to his people. We just really enjoyed working with him. You eventually became associate producer of Hogan's Heroes and you directed 10 episodes of the show. I read that there was great animosity between John Banner, who played Sergeant Schultz, and Werner Klemperer, who played Colonel Klink. Is that true? Well, it it was an animosity, but they didn't hate each other. It was what the problem was, was Schultz, John Banner got all the laughs and (laughs) Werner got all the Emmys. You know, it's just the way it happened, you know. But they were always teasing each other. And, of course, the heroes and the rest of the crew loved to needle them. They, you know, they'd sit around and when we do the readings a lot. And they were, the readings uh, before we start shooting on Mondays, that was the funniest part of uh, the show because these guys would have to live and you'd break up. The, the funniest guy there was Richard Dawson. I mean, this guy really was the wit. And um, the readings were sensational. And of course, we'd hear the material. We'd, and if something didn't get a laugh, the writers were there and they'd, they'd change it. So when we started our rehearsal day on Tuesday, we'd get new pages. And then we filmed Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You know, that's the way it worked. Now, your career evolved first from editing to producing to directing. You wrote that director Gene Reynolds gave you a great piece of advice about blocking. He said, always try to bring motion into a scene and let the dialogue guide you through the blocking. That's one of your trademarks, isn't it, Jerry, in staging to get good movement into the dialogue? I I do. I I try to get as much movement into a scene as possible. You know, when you see some of these television shows and, uh, and two people are sitting in a booth talking, it's It's boring. And uh, you have to think ahead of time, what would they do? Would they be walking through a park? Would they be outside, even if they're in a car, you know? But uh, motion helps uh, the overall episode, you know, have a flow to it. So I'm always looking for that. The other thing I look for is deep backgrounds, which means I like to put the actors in the foreground and see way in the back to get the scope. A lot of guys who don't think, they shoot them against a wall or, you know, against a window, and it's not interesting. I'd rather have the depth of it. Very few directors have the kind of background in film editing that you have. Did that training and experience as an editor make you a better director? Absolutely. What it did, it took the pressure off when I go to the stage as to, gee, what am I going to do? I knew what I was going to do because I would cut the film uh, in my head as I read the script. So I knew exactly the way it should look. Of course, you make adjustments, you always do. But yeah, that, that's, that's exactly what happened. Before you started directing, you went to an actor's workshop and you took a drama class at UCLA and you even studied psychology for two years. Is there a special way that directors talk to actors? Well, the main thing you have to get their confidence as soon as possible. When you talk to an actor and you say, hello, he's going to look you in the eye and he he wants to know that you want to really give him the confidence so he will listen to you. And actors are pretty good about it. I mean, I can read, of course, I, I, I gained the ability to read actors after, you know, about a year because the psychology courses gave you the depth of what to ask them and, and to ask them questions to show them that you knew what you were doing. But it was uh, the drama and uh, uh, working with actors and staging the stage plays, which I did at UCLA and SC, were valuable 
but the psychology, the psychology was the most important because I always gained the confidence of the actor right away. Well, how important is trust in the relationship between an actor and a director? Well, it's it, that's the whole thing. It's very important. If they don't trust you, they're gonna they're gonna experiment, and sometimes it'll be in the wrong way. You have to guide them, you know. And and most actors, the bigger the actors are, the the better they are. When I was working with Gregory Peck, he always said to me, or, or John Gielgud, they say, "Don't be afraid to talk to me. You tell me what you want. You want it fast. You want it slower. Are you reading what I'm thinking, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Very open. It's it's the young neophyte actors that have a bigger ego and they they can't bring you in unless they have the confidence you know the problem is they don't they haven't had a lot of experience and they don't have the confidence so you got to give them the confidence through you you directed four episodes of kojak and you said that telly savalas never rehearsed and had a photographic memory and that he got it right every time how rare is that for an actor? Well, the good ones can do it. Uh, Jimmy Garner was the same way. I mean, but he, uh, Jimmy would like to rehearse because he was looking to get more humor out of the scene. So he, he would rehearse, but Telly, all he was interested in is playing around. He said, okay, where do you want me? Let's shoot it. Okay, take one good. All right, let me go. And then he goes off the set because he was a player, see? But the funny guy, great guy, great personality. And he was Kojak. I mean, there's no acting there. But he is Telly is Kojak. I also have to mention Betty Davis, whom you directed in Hotel. You said she had an extraordinary work ethic and that she knew everyone's lines, not only her own lines. Isn't that amazing, Jerry? Yeah. And at the time, she I think she was in her early 80s or mid 80s. And then she was, you know, she's a little minute thing when you see her on the screen. Of course, she's bigger than life. And she was, you know, she, I guess she's maybe five feet tall and, you know, a skinny 90 pounds. And uh, for that age, she was very intelligent. And I noticed that when she wasn't filming, she'd sit in her chair and she was on the set. She was interested to see the whole process. And she stayed there and went, went to lunch. And after lunch, she'd come right back. And it was just very interesting. And I've never seen an actor do that before. You wrote about the challenges of getting good performances out of some actors whose behavior was problematic, to say the least. People like David Jansen, Tony Franciosa, Ray Sharkey, Glenn Ford, for example. And Jerry, you managed to get a brilliant performance out of Brad Davis in Chiefs. How did you do that? Well, that was interesting because he had a bad reputation before I hired him and everybody the network said, why do you want to deal with this guy? Because, you know, he was a, a drinker and maybe a user, a user. And but I, you know, one of my favorite movies was Midnight Express, which was so brilliant. He was brilliant. Man. So I took him to lunch and I explained, uh, you know, look, you know, your your reputation is following you and, and nobody wants to hire you. And he says, I know, but this is a great part and I, I got to do it. I want to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, okay. And then we had lunch. And then I went to the network and I said, I'd like to have him. And they said, you, you're crazy. You're going to put your reputation on the line for this guy? And I said, well, it feels right. So I met with him again. And I said, look, Brad, I'm going to hire you. But if you, if you screw up, it's me. You're, you're going to kill your director because I'm, I'm really sticking my neck out for you. Oh, and he's, he hugged me and he said, I'm so grateful. And of course, he was brilliant. He was so, he was always prepared, brilliant actor. And at the end of that episode, I did, uh, Chiefs was three hour, uh, three, two hour episodes. And at, on his last shot, it, you know, the AD would say, okay, this is, uh, that's a wrap on Brad. And the whole audience, all the crew and everybody else applauded, applauded him. I mean, actually applauded him. And he, hit the floor and put his hands up and he started crying. And boy, was that a moment. Wow. Wow. And I think that was his last great performance, wasn't it? I think so. I think he did some other little minor parts. And um, I don't know whether it was a year or, or so later he, he passed on. I say he, he just couldn't control his addictions. It's too bad. But, you know, Jerry, you have some kind of a magic touch because 
Another example, you directed Richard Burton in his final performance in Ellis Island. And it's well known that by the time you made that miniseries, Richard Burton was very debilitated due to his drinking. How in the world did you manage to get such a great performance out of him? Well, that was really my editing experience. I had to shoot a lot more film than normal. And I would know that if I got this, this part of it right, then I could go to the next section. And then I do, you know, I broke it all down. It's what I did and chowed it in pieces. And um, he was, you know, he was a very nice man, but he, his brain was pickled. He couldn't remember anything. You know, he just, after all those years of the booze and stuff, it, it really got to him. It was a shame because he was such a, really a nice man. So his performance was basically pieced together in the editing room. That's right. Exactly. And of course, one of the reasons he did the show was his daughter was in it. You know, Kate Burton was in Ellis Island. And, and so that's why he wanted to do it. You know, we were, I had finished shooting with him and we were still going. And the word came down. He passed on. You know, she went left and went to the funeral. It's very sad. Very sad. You know, Jerry, when I was doing my research about you, you have a reputation in Hollywood for being a consistent, reliable director who got big production values, even with small budgets. What was your secret? I had the time. Most, most of the people are directors who don't prepare well. Shoot a film that you don't need. And in, in the editing process in my brain, I knew exactly what I wanted. And if I wanted something big and scopy, I would sacrifice in another scene something and make it more simple, which gave me extra time to give me the scope. And of course, you got to prep, prep it very well and, and let everybody know, hey, this is not a small movie. This is a big movie and I want more extras and, you know, everything. And as long as you tell, inform your people, your crew and everything, you'll get it. So, Jerry, let's talk about Shogun, which is widely considered to be the greatest miniseries of all time. It won three Emmys, a Golden Globe, a Director's Guild of America Award, and a Peabody Award for Cultural Advancement. The logistics were mind-boggling. Five episodes, 1,062 scenes, including sea battles, earthquakes, and ninja attacks. Out of a crew of 150 people, only 30 spoke English, so you had to work through interpreters. And some of the conditions you had to live through in Japan were incredibly primitive. You described the filming as arduous, frustrating, and complicated. Jerry, was there ever a moment when you felt like throwing in the towel and quitting? Absolutely. After about uh, the first four weeks, we filmed for six months. After the first four weeks, I was pretty exhausted. And one of the reasons I, I'd analyze and I said, I can't figure out why am I so tired? I usually I'm not, you know. And so I analyzed my day and the way it worked was I would go on the stage and the actors would line up and the crew and I would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. And I would explain it to them and point and stuff. And my interpreter, who was a, was a, a, a lady, would now go to the crew and explain to them what I had said. Because, uh, you know, and 85% of them never spoke English, but they would look at me and, and they knew I was directing them. And so then they'd have a little conversation and then she'd come back to me and she said, OK, this is what they understand. And then she'd repeat it. Now, with all these steps that went on, uh, it took a lot of time. And so every day was hard and arduous and I was tired and I said, you know, I just can't go on for another five months like this. I got to do something different. So I went to the interpreter and I said, look, all this cross talk back and forth. I tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to I'm going to tell the crew in my own words what I want and don't give them any interpretation unless they ask for it. So that's what I did. I'd say, OK, here's what we're going to do, et cetera, et cetera. And then I go sit in my chair and then instead of her having to go through a 10 minute explanation to everybody, one or two people would, uh, would come over to her and ask her things. And then we went to work. And after the second week, I wasn't tired anymore because I had I eliminated all these steps. And again, this was the psychology of how do you get what you want? That's what it, 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 I, I knew I had to change something. And, and, and a lot of the Japanese 
understood enough English so they didn't have to need an explanation. Is Shogun the work that you're most proud of? Well, it, it definitely. I mean, uh, that and The Scarlet and the Black are two of the greatest scripts I ever read. But uh, Shogun is probably the most complicated piece of film ever done. I mean, they, they call it the gun with the wind of television. And they tried to do another one uh, of Clavel's books, which was Gaijin about uh, three or four years ago. And uh, I was busy doing something else. And after two days of filming, they shut down because nothing went right. And the director didn't have the psychology how to fix it. He did just, he was sinking and they canceled the show. It was a shame. I want to mention to our viewers that Shogun has recently been re-released as a DVD set, including an additional 90 minute disc on the making of Shogun featuring interviews with Jerry London and many others. Jerry, I understand you were involved in the making of that special feature, correct? That's right. And the reason for it was everybody, my friends would come to me and say, look, you did Shogun. Can you make me a copy of it? And you make me a copy. And I said, you know, it's, it's 10, 11 hours long. I can't sit and, <laughs> and keep throwing tapes in the, in, in the, I just can't do it. And so after about, you know, three or four months of this, I said, well, and uh, they started making the making of, I saw that they were making it on various shows. I said, well, we got to do this. So I went to Paramount. And I explained to them, look, I've got a lot of the material and I've got props and I've got uh, pictures and even reels of film behind the scenes stuff, which I, uh, I had them do and we just put it aside. I never knew what we were going to do with it. But since we, um, I had an inclination, I guess, about it someday. And so we did this whole thing and uh, Paramount gave me a producer and we did a lot of interviews and the cutting and uh, it turned out really well. It's 90 minutes. And I always say to the people, run that first before you run the show. So you see the problems that I had to encounter to get it done. You know, Jerry, when I was reading your book, I was thinking to myself that when you were making so many great miniseries in the seventies, there were no VCRs. So if you missed the broadcast, you were out of luck unless there was a rerun. But now we can get DVDs of almost every miniseries ever made. It must be so gratifying to you that your work is constantly attracting new audiences. It is. Uh, there's a couple of them that haven't come out yet. And I'm, I kept trying to find out why Wheels or Chiefs aren't on DVD. And for, I think what it is, is it, some corporate people who buy it, bought it. I don't forgot what company I was. I don't think they realize uh, the gold that's there that they should really put it out. So if anybody knows anybody, I'd sure like to get a couple of DVDs on those two. because They were very good. Yeah, those were tremendously successful miniseries, highly acclaimed. I really hope they come out in DVD. Me too. Now, Jerry, you said in the book, and I'm quoting you here, a good script is the sole backbone of any quality film. Were there times you were pressured to direct a movie or a TV show that you didn't want to do because of a weak script, but you had to do it anyway just to please a Hollywood big shot? <laughs> well, there's that one instance, and I think I mentioned it in my book. I worked for David Gerber, who did a lot of shows. He did the Police Woman, Police Story at Columbia. A really a nice man and a great salesman. He liked me and I, you know, he, he called me when I was in Toronto working on a, on a film and he said, look, I got a, a pilot I want you to do. When you finish, can I send it to you? And I said, yeah, okay. So he sent it to me and I read it and it was just dreadful. So when I got home, I didn't call him back because of, you know, I didn't want to turn him down. So he called me and a couple of days later at home. He says, hey, you didn't call me. Uh, what happened? I said, look, I read it, but I'm so tired. I, I can't do it. I, I really, I, it's just, I, I'm, I'm exhausted. Well, all I know is two weeks later, I was shooting it. He was this great of a salesman. He was such a great salesman, the nicest guy. And, you know, they fixed part of the script, but it was, it was, it was never really anything. I shouldn't have done it. But I liked the, I liked the producer. Now, you've taught film production at the USC School of Cinematic Arts the American Film School in Hollywood and, and at UCLA. 
What's the most important piece of advice you give aspiring young filmmakers? I always say, be sure you have a great piece of material before you go out and shoot it. And if you have a friend who's a writer, because most of these kids wrote their own stuff, have them read your material and get suggestions and just know that you have a great piece of material because if you film something that's mediocre, because the script's mediocre, it's not going to get too much better. So I always, always, as I said before, try to find a great script. And that, that's really the secret. The technical background is easy to learn. It's getting that piece of material that works. So do you watch a lot of TV shows now and Netflix and Amazon Prime? I, my favorites are watching the old movies. So I'm always looking for those old movies. I've watched a lot of those. And I watch a lot of the new movies, but, you know, the new stuff, again, I, I just have to say the writing isn't up to what it used to be in the, in the 70s and the 80s. So it's disappointing. But I like to sample everything that's new just to see what they're selling and what's happening out there. I spend a lot of time watching television. I do even now. I find that interesting because some people are saying that we are now in another golden age of television because we have all these platforms. There's all this binge watching of these series, uh, but you don't find the quality that good? Some of them are, are very good. But uh, overall, uh, you know, HBO and Stars and those companies, I think they have a better quality control than Netflix. Net Netflix has quantity, but I, I, I don't find that the quality is up to the quantity. I mean, if you make 100 shows a year and six of them are good, that's a pretty poor average, you know. So I, I think whoever's uh, developing this stuff at Netflix, and they'll probably hate me for saying it, they better get somebody that really knows material. <laughs> You wrote in the book that there's no price on integrity and it pays to be fearless in the face of obstacles. I would say that's been your motto throughout your whole career, hasn't it? Well, I like to solve problems. And when you're filming, every day has tons of problems. It never really works the way you want to. Whether an actor is sick and whether a prop doesn't work or the wardrobe's wrong or you just can't get it or an actor doesn't know his lines. And you've got to solve problems day and night. And uh, that's what a good director does. He's a problem solver. But you never seemed to panic. You know, when I was reading through your book about all the different obstacles you faced, you somehow took a deep breath. You never lost control. You stayed calm. It must be part of your personality. You can't teach that. Well, that's, that's funny that you picked that up because I get that from a lot of actors I work with. They said, geez, under all this pressure and everything, you're sure cool. And it's because I've done so much work now that I have the confidence that I can solve any problem, and especially after Shogun, everything is like kindergarten after doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, I want you to just listen to some of these memorable moments in your life that you wrote about in the book. As a young man, you went to the racetrack with Desi Arnaz and Fernando Lamas. You shot an episode of Love American Style that Sid Caesar completely rewrote on the day of filming, and you brought the show in on time. You got to watch Rock Hudson do his needlepoint on the set. Gina Lola Brigida gave you a tour of her home. You were actually granted permission to shoot inside the Coliseum and the Vatican, in a movie starring Gregory Peck, Christopher Plummer, and Sir John Gielgud. And you had a private tour of the Sistine Chapel with the curator. And you got to film at Michelli's, the most famous Italian restaurant in Hollywood. And that's just scratching the surface. Jerry, when you look back at your life, do you have to pinch yourself to realize the extraordinary career you've had? Well, I, I, boy, you've done a lot of research. That's great. <laughs> No, I, you know, I am very lucky. I really am. And when I look back at it, and, and those moments are really precious. And I'm happy that I've ha had the ability to do all the things and travel. You know, the main thing when I, I, I film all over the world in almost every country, and I always made a point of it to 
see the see the country I'm working on, and after I film, go to another country. So I, the the business has given me the opportunity to see the world, and it's been very good to me. Would you say that your family had to make big sacrifices? I mean, you were away in Japan for six months. Well, my wife came a couple of times, but she was very good about you know raising my children, and I I did really miss being with my kids a lot because I I was on location so much. But uh, both of them did okay. My daughter's a casting director for years, and my son is a vice president at Walt Disney, so they did all right. You must have done something right. You know, Jerry, you said in your book that in your experience working with actors, you found that the greater the talent, the easier they were to work with. And I want you to know that I found the same thing to be true on my show. The greater the talent, the easier they are to interview. And you, Mr. Jerry London, are solid proof of that. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. Well, it's been my pleasure, and, and I thank you for all the, the research and the, the background. You made it easy for me. You, you did such a great job. That was terrific. You, you, you've, you've sent me back to memory lane. It was terrific. I really loved it. It was a pleasure. Our guest has been legendary director, producer, and author Jerry London. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.